That our hearts are ready, not just on Sundays, but that your every day, that the word is what you live by and you feed yourself with because it is our daily bread. Emphasis on daily. It feeds you. If you don't eat it, it doesn't feed you. So we need to feed ourselves with the Word of God. And there are so many beautiful stories and examples in the Word of God that we can find and apply into our own lives. Even if you have heard the story many times before. I mean, I've read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation multiple times now in my life. But there's always something new that speaks to your heart. There's always, the Word of God is alive. And until you breathe your last breath, you cannot find a person on the face of this earth that says, I already know everything. I know the Lord 100%. I mean, I don't think I even know Him for 1%. Because he's so much bigger than I can imagine, Amen. than I can understand. How do you explain a God that speaks and everything comes into existence? How do you explain a God that knows all the stars because he gave them names and he put them in their place? And that's just the galaxy that we know about. So how do you explain that? How, how do you grasp that concept of how big he is? It's not possible. But when you start to think about that, how big it is, and you understand that you cannot really understand that concept of how big he is, that puts our problems in perspective. Because the God who speaks and it comes into existence, when he speaks into your life, when he speaks into your situation, everything changes. Amen. Everything changes. Amen. And there are so many stories in the Word of God where we can see that where Jesus comes, things change. Amen. And the topic of the sermon today is, you matter to the Master. Amen. You matter to him. Amen. That's the Lord. You matter to him. You're important to him. He loves you more than words can say. And the story that we will look into this, this morning is found in Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, and I will read from verse 11 to 17. I will read it from the New King James Version. And it says, Now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And the large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, Arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. Ah, what a story. I don't know the last time you went to a funeral, but I'm pretty sure this did not happen. What a day. What an amazing moment we read about here. I want to put this story in a little context here because it starts with it happened the day after so it says something about what happened previously previously the day before Jesus was in Capernaum and there he met this centurion who came to him and said Lord my servant is sick 
And I love my servant very much. He's a good servant. And Jesus said, okay, I will come to you. I will come with you and I will come to your house. And this centurion said, no, no, no. I'm not worthy for you to be under my roof. But I understand what it means when you have authority. Because I'm a man of authority in the Roman army. I command my soldiers to go. If they say go left, they go left. If I say go right, they go right. They do whatever I tell them to do. And I believe for you it is enough to just speak the word. Amen. Hallelujah. To just speak the word Amen. over my servant. Amen. And I believe he will be healed. Amen. And Jesus said, it is done. Amen. And the Bible says that when the centurion arrived at his home, his servant was completely healed. And he said, he asked his servant, when exactly did this happen? And it happened at the exact hour that Jesus said, it is done. The moment Jesus spoke the word, that servant got healed. And Jesus testified about the centurion. He said, I have found no greater faith in all of Israel. What a faith. To believe that when Jesus speaks a word, it is done. The centurion was not present. He didn't see it happen the moment Jesus spoke the word. He still had to go home. He still had to trust. He still had to believe. He still had to walk that journey. Believing that when he arrived home, it would be done. He didn't know where Jesus was traveling after this. We know because we read where he went. But he didn't know that. He, he couldn't go home and, and, and then discover it didn't happen and say, oh, I have to go back. But when he got back, Jesus was already gone. He had to believe the word that was spoken. And he believed and he received according to his faith. Amen. And this is what we read so many times in scripture. Your faith has made you well. Your faith, it's your faith. It is by faith we receive. Amen. It is only by faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So faith is crucial Amen. in everything we do. Amen. And when you have received a word from the Lord, hold on to it. Let nothing steal it from you. Let no promise of God be stolen from you by any negative remarks by any negative feelings, negative thoughts. So many thoughts can enter your mind and there are days that you really have to battle them. You have to battle them. You have to counter them with the word of God. You have to stand on his word. Even if you only know one scripture, Amen. fight it with that scripture. Amen. Because the Word of God is always more powerful Amen. than anything that comes against it. Amen. Even if you feel like you lack knowledge of the Word of God, use what you do know. Amen. When you use what you know from the Word of God, you will always prevail. Amen. If you hold on to it, you will always prevail. Amen. But now this story says, the day after, the day after this wonderful miracle of the centurion servant. It means that Jesus went from Capernaum to Nain. To understand this, Capernaum was at the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And it was below sea level. About 120 meters, I believe, below sea level. He had to go up to Nain. That was a journey of about 55 kilometers. And he had to go to 200 meters above sea level. So it was an uphill journey. Since they didn't have cars or bikes or anything like that, they always had to walk. So do you like walking? Yes. I like, like walking. Yes. The rest is just silent. <laughs> <laughs> if you have to walk for 55 kilometers, how long do you think that will take you? I can tell you the average speed of normal walking is 5 kilometers per hour. 
to about 10, 11 hours. That is on a flat surface. But now he, he had to go up, up here. So 12 hours maybe, minimum. 12 hours minimum. So if he would have left like in the afternoon, he had to walk like through the night to arrive there next morning, right? This is to give you an idea that it was, it was not just, oh, the next day. It was actually 12 hours, a minimum of 12 hours later. I don't know about you, but if you have to walk for 12 hours to get to a place where you need to go, it must be really important to get there. I mean, for us, if you have a car, you just take the car. 55 kilometers, you're there like... 30 minutes, you're there. But to go to a place and you know you have to walk uphill for at least 12 hours, you have to be really determined. It's not nothing, it's a big thing. Now you have to understand that the place Nain, it means pleasant in Hebrew. So if you hear that there's a pleasant place, you would be tempted to go there and to find out if it's actually pleasant. There are some places like Nain that are not mentioned often in scripture. It's only mentioned once and that's in this story. Nain, the Bible says it was a city, it was a small city, mostly occupied by farmers. And it was the most southern part of Galilee where Jesus ministered. It was off the beaten track. It was not on a commercial route. It was just farmers. And unless you had something to do in Nain, you would not really go there. There were no spas or something like that. If, if you really love farming, you can go there. But all you see is farming land, you know, crops, stuff like that. It's funny because when I was on holiday, my parents moved back to the region when they were born and raised, where I was born and raised. So I stayed with them there. And one morning, we were, we were driving through the countryside and I saw places, names of places that I said, wow. I didn't know that place existed because they're really small. And I saw the names and I, and I asked my dad, Dad, have you ever been to that place? He was like, yeah, once. I said, why did you go there? He said, because when I saw the name, I said, I've never been there. I, I just want to find out what it's like. <laughs> and I said, you only went there once. He said, yeah, because there's nothing there. <laughs> there's nothing to do. It's just people live there and it's mostly elderly people that live there. And, and besides that, there's nothing. So he said, I just drove in, and, and a few minutes later, I drove out. I was like, okay, that was it. And I, I saw many of those places, there were those names, and I was like, yeah, I've never been there. Why not? Because there's nothing to do. Unless you know someone who lives there, you will not go to that place. Nain was a place like that. There was one road in, one road out. Unless you had business there, you didn't go there. But Jesus took a 12-hour journey to go to a place where nobody usually goes. Why? There must have been something really important for him to do there. Because otherwise you would not go there. And then look at this story. Because when, when he arrives at Nain, he's not entered the city just yet. He's approaching the city gate. And right at that time, this woman, this widow, with, with a large crowd, comes outside of the city gate, carrying out her son who had passed away. I don't know about you, but the chances that you exactly meet a person at a certain spot, not big. 
I mean, we all live in the same city, but I don't see you every day. Chances that you meet each other are slim. But for Jesus to arrive at the exact time that, that, that she carried out her son, I mean, that's a time frame of maybe a minute on a 12-hour-plus journey. If you can time it like that, if, if you have a 12-hour journey and you meet a friend somewhere and you are able to say, I will be there at 3.01 on the dot in the afternoon, kudos to you. Because that's not easy. Depending traffic and you know whatever can happen along the way. But Jesus met them exactly on that moment. Don't tell me that's a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidence. God knows what he's doing. He's never too early. He's never too late. He knows exactly when that group would step outside of the city gate. And Jesus met them there. Amen. That is the amazing God that we serve. Amen. God is able to do that. Amen. And she was the only reason that he took that 12 hour plus journey. She was the only reason. There was no other purpose. There was nothing else to do in Nain. After this, Jesus left Nain. Because there was no other reason for him to stay there. He went off the beaten track because of her. This is how much God loves you. God is still the same today. And when he came there, the Bible says he saw her. He saw her. You know, you can say, yeah, of course he saw her because she was there, he was there. No, he saw her. When God sees you, it's more than he just physically sees you sitting here. Amen. When God sees you, he sees your heart. He knows your thoughts. He knows your cries. He knows your needs. He sees. He sees what no man can see. Man can see your sadness on the outside, but God sees the reason. But he's also the solution. Amen. Because as she walked outside of the city gates, and her son, who had passed, was carried out, the Bible says a large crowd joined her. I said to myself, well, you know, Sometimes you have large crowds. It means that you're well-known or, or well-respected or really loved. But I've learned that in, in communities that are off the beaten track, where people don't really go because there's nothing to do, those communities are strong. They stick together. When someone passes away, it has an impact on the entire community. And in her case, the Bible says, and she was a widow. It wasn't the first funeral. She had lost her husband, didn't remarry, lived together with her son. Her son was the one who would provide for her who would find a job and, 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 and earn an income. And, and, and you know, that, that was her means to live. She was, he was her everything. He was also the one that carried the family name. It was a big deal, especially in those days. It was a big deal because the names were always written down. They were always remembered, even when, when you had properties. No matter how small the children were, it was, it was passed on. And your name would be written down and would be remembered. But now with, with his passing the name, the legacy would die. It would vanish. 
no longer to be remembered. The Bible doesn't say exactly how she dealt with it. It doesn't speak about her praying or anything. Because most of the miracles that we see in the life of Jesus is when Jesus was in, in, in Jerusalem and people met him. Or he was on his way to Jericho or in Jericho and people met him. But in this case, nobody called. Jesus went there on purpose for her. It was not that he was just walking through the streets and people said, Oh, Jesus is here. Let's, let's bring people. Let's bring the sick. That's what usually happened. In this case, it was not. It was Jesus who intentionally went there just for her. Just for her. And then he sees her and he has compassion on her. You know, I can imagine this. This, this, this large crowd walking with her. And they're all sad. They all feel sorry for her. They all grieve with her. But Jesus had compassion on her. You know, there's a difference between grieving with someone and having compassion for someone. Because compassion compels you to act. To do something. To help the person. And I'm sure that all of them wanted to help her. But in all of their minds, I believe that they had helped her to the best of their abilities until the boy died. And that is what we, humanly speaking, can do. We can help a person until death steps in. And then for us as human beings, we say, well, there's nothing I can do now. I, I can help you with the arrangements of the funeral. I can, I can walk with you. I can greet with you. But you know that it, it, it's fine. It's over. But Jesus, he had compassion on her. And he knew, I can do something. I have the power to do something. What is final to mankind is not final to me. Amen. God always has the final say. Amen. Amen. And he looks at her and then he says, do not weep. When you think about it, she had every right to cry. She had every right to mourn and be sad. But Jesus said, do not weep. You know, that was from the compassion. That was, that was already the introduction to something good is going to happen now. You have reason to cry, but cry no more. Because something's about to change. Amen. We don't know. I can imagine this widow. You know, the Bible doesn't give all the details sometimes. But you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out certain things or imagine certain things. I can imagine this widow the night before being unable to sleep, crying over the loss of her son, having to carry out the body of her son the next day. I can imagine her crying out to God in, in desperation. I mean, that is what we do. When we have pain, when we, when we are hurt, when we are grieving, we cry out to God. Amen. And you can have many questions. Why God? I already lost my husband and now my son. Lord, have I done something wrong? I don't understand. I live in a place called Pleasant. It is not pleasant at all. It is everything but pleasant. The Bible says in Psalms 30 verse 10, Hear, O Lord. And have mercy on me. Lord be my helper. Amen. Those people knew the Psalms. In those days they knew the Psalms. I can imagine her praying something like that. Hear, hear me Lord. Help me, have mercy on me. Look at my life, it's a mess. I've lost everything that was dear to me. 
imagine this with me for a moment. In the night as she could not sleep and cried out to God, Jesus was already walking towards me. Because it took him more than 12 hours. As she was battling, as she was grieving, as she was crying out to God, God was already on his way. He didn't start walking one hour before. He was already on his way. So many times, God is already on his way. God is already on his way even before we cry. Even before we ask him. I have a very simple example for you. I think I shared it before, I'm not sure. When I was in university, I had a big exam coming up. I studied well for it because I knew if I, if I pass it, I will move on to the next year. If I fail it, I'm in trouble. It was a big one. So I did everything I could. I got up early and every morning I had to take my bike and I had to cycle towards the train station that was outside of the village that I lived in. It was about three kilometers, four. So I took my bike, started cycling, had a flat tire. Great. Had to go back. I was, I was still early. I could still catch a bus. So I waited at the bus stop. No bus. No bus. I was like, what is this? My train is about to leave in five minutes, and there's no bus. And I stood there just by myself. And I said, Lord, I don't understand. I did everything I could do. I, I studied well. I prepared myself. I got up early. I got my bike. I had a flat tire. I got here early to catch the bus. The bus is late, or there's no bus. I don't understand what's going on. But Lord, my train is leaving in five minutes. If I don't catch that train, I will be too late to take the exam. Within 10 seconds, I kid you not, within 10 seconds, a car stops just behind the bus stop. The window goes down. It's my uncle. He owned the garage. He was driving a sports car that morning. He said, I did the full checkup for this car. I'm just test driving it now. There's somewhere you need to go? Yes. The train station. Hop in. I'll take you there. I thank God that he came. I thank God that it was a sports car because I only had five minutes. He dropped me off at the train station. I ran towards the platform. The train arrived. I entered and off we went. I realized if God only would have heard me when I prayed, my uncle would not have been there. Because the moment I started praying was already five minutes before the train left. He would have had to wake up my uncle, get him dressed, get in the car, and end up at the bus stop. But my uncle, you know, the Lord already set everything in motion before I asked him. And it was the same for this widow. She was crying and she didn't understand. And you, sometimes you wrestle with God. But God was already on his way. Amen. Jesus was already walking towards me in a place nobody visits. The moment you cry out to him, he's already on his way. Amen. The answer is already on its way. Hallelujah. Jesus is already moving. Bless the Lord. And then when they finally meet, he says, do not weep. You may not understand the words. You may be like, how can you say that? Don't you know? You see what's going on here? How can you? I have every right. But I can tell you this. When you receive a word from God, and it makes no sense, it's still a word from God. Amen. Amen. And a word from God changes everything. Amen. It changes. Everything, yes. It changes your mindset. 
It changes how you feel. The word brings healing. Amen. It brings healing to the soul. Even when the words make no sense to you at the time. When you receive them, they touch your heart. Amen. They bring something to life inside of you. Because my question would be, do not weep. Why not? Why not? The answer didn't take long to that question. Because right after he said, do not weep, Jesus started to move towards the open coffin. And the Bible says he touched the open coffin. And then everything stood still. It was like a freezing moment in time. Everything, everything comes to a standstill. Because the people looked at what Jesus did. You know, they didn't have time to start a debate with him. Why should she not cry? How can you say do not weep? There was no time for that. Because the moment they were baffled about do not weep, he already touched the open coffin. And they were like, what? Don't you know the law? Everyone who touches something that's dead will be unclean. They were just baffled. They were like, he, he's speaking nonsense, and now he does. And, and, and before the shock was over, and they, they got to their senses again, he looked at the boy, and he said, young man, listen to me. Arise. I mean, this was above and beyond what they could understand. They just looked at the situation. They didn't have the faith for that to happen. But they were the witnesses of God. And the moment that Jesus says, arise to that young man. I love how the Bible described that. He who was dead set up and began to speak. I guess he was no longer dead. One word. One word. Weep not. Arise. God doesn't need many words to do great things. But I want you to hear this today. She mattered. Amen. She mattered to Jesus. She was the only reason he went all the way to that place where there was nothing to do. He walked through the night to get there in time. God does above and beyond in your life for whatever your need is. Amen. For whatever your need is. The problem many times that we face, we don't want him to come when the sun is already dead. We want him to come when he's still alive. When he may be sick, something is wrong, at least he's still alive. Amen. We don't want him to die. And when, when he comes to die, then we think, oh, now it's too late. Now it's too late. Now we better not bother the master anymore. Now we better not ask him anymore. This is what David did. When David had his first child with Bathsheba, God confronted David through Nathan that he had committed sin. The Lord said that his child would die. And David sat with his baby day and night. And he prayed and he cried. 
until the point that he refused to eat and the servants thought, this is not going well. This is not going well. He, 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 he went into the presence of the Lord. He prayed there. He fasted there. He, he, he spent all his time there. He cried out to God. And then they had to bring him the news, your child has passed away. And they were afraid to give him the news. Because they said, if he already behaves like that when the child is still alive, what will he do? But the moment they came to him and said, Sir, your child has passed away. He washed himself and he said, let's eat. And they said, how can you do that? He said, because as long as the child was alive, there was a chance that God would do something. Amen. But now I know that. And God said, I will take the child. God has taken the child. Sometimes we pray until we think it's all over. Mm -hmm. But never give up hope. Amen. Amen. Because you matter to the Master. Amen. Amen. What you're going through, it matters to Him. What you're struggling with, it matters to Him. What you're crying about, it matters to Him. What causes you pain, it matters to Him. He knows it. He knows every detail. But if he took that long journey to get to this widow, will he not do the same for you? When she cried out, he heard. Amen. The father heard. And the father instructed his son, I want you to move to Nain. I want you to go there. Now you cry out to the father, God hears. Amen. God hears. Amen. And the answer is already on its way. Amen. Amen. It's already on its way. And when it comes and you receive from the Lord, maybe you receive a word and it makes no sense to you. Just trust Him. Amen. Just let Him do what only He can do. Don't take the matter into your own hands. Let Him do what only He can do. Because He is still a miracle working God. And God knows today what you're going through. Amen. Because when I read that psalm earlier, and it said, Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. Maybe that is your cry today. Lord, have mercy on me. There are things happening, I, I don't know why. I don't understand. But Lord, have mercy on me and be my helper. Mm -hmm. Jesus came to this lady and gave her back her son. In the next verses in this psalm, Psalm 30, verse 11 and 12, it says, You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Forever. When Jesus comes, everything changes. Everything that you battle with, everything that you struggle with, everything that causes you pain and grief, maybe not understood at the moment, but put your trust in Him. Jesus is on His way. He will do a miracle for you, bigger than what you ever could imagine. He will do it for you because He makes His Word come to pass. He's not a man that He should lie. All His promises are yes and amen. In Christ Jesus, you matter. To the master. Amen. Let us close our eyes for a moment. Because God knows exactly what you're going through. He knows where you are in your heart, in your mind, in your life. Maybe it's a disappointment to you. Maybe you struggle with things and you try to figure it out, but you keep hitting that same wall. Maybe your cry is, hear me, Lord. Hear me, Lord. 
have mercy on me. Help me. Sometimes that's all you need to pray. You don't have to explain into detail everything to him because he already knows. He's longing for us to cry out to him. And then when he comes, we realize he was already on his way even before I cried. Do you need him to touch today? Maybe there's something that is dead in your life. When he touched that coffin, everything came to a standstill. And then he spoke life into that boy. When God speaks, it produces life. It produces life in your situation. It produces life in dreams that have died. It revives what has died. What is it that you need today? The Lord has heard your cry. The Lord sees you and he has compassion on you. And he says, weep not, for your mourning will also turn into dancing. Your weeping will also turn into joy. And you will praise me. And you will glorify me. Is it that? Is it that what you need today? If you need me to pray with you right now, just raise your hand for a moment and say, yes, Pastor, please pray with me. Pray for me. Because the things that I'm going through, many times I don't understand. I'm dealing with things that are greater than I am. But I have put my trust in the Lord and I have cried to the Lord and I trust the Lord to step in today. I know the Lord is on His way. I believe that He will come and He will do what only He can do. I believe that He will revive that which has died. I believe that He will restore whatever is broken and damaged. Oh, hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that we know that you have compassion on us. Lord, I thank you that you're already on your way. Lord, I thank you that you have heard the cries of your children. Lord, I thank you that with you all things are possible. You are the resurrection and the life. Oh, yes. Lord, I thank you that one word from you, one touch from you, it changes everything, Lord. And Lord, by faith, we receive today. We receive the miracle that we need. Lord, we walk in that miracle. We walk in that victory. We walk according to your word. We believe your word is true. We believe your word will come to pass in our lives, in our situations. Lord, there's breakthrough. There's victory. There's joy. There's dancing. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you step in right now. Lord, thank you that you met that woman right at the right time that you meet us at the right time and do what only you can do. Thank you, Lord. We receive it today. We believe we have received it. Oh, Lord, we praise you. We thank you. We glorify you that we receive all by faith. Hallelujah. And that you are our joy and our hope and our strength. That you go before us. That you make a way where there is no way. That you will do what only you can do. That you are miracles today. Oh Lord, receive our worship. Receive all the glory and the honor. Receive all our thanksgiving, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We have received it by faith in our hearts. And our eyes will see it, Lord. But we will keep on speaking it until we see it come to pass. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that you dry the tears of your children. And you give unspeakable joy in our hearts. We praise you. We glorify you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Believe that you have received it. Believe it. And speak according to the faith that you have. Speak words of faith. Don't speak negative. 
Don't allow the negative. Weep not, for Jesus is with you. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you.